there's anyone here who has served, uh, I want to ask you to stand at this time so we can recognize and salute you. Thank you both for your service to this country and to the Lord. I, I, I do want to say, uh, while we, we are here to worship the Lord, um, uh, Memorial Day does remind us of uh, the sacrifice that so many have made. And like everything, we, everything else we see, uh, these things don't come out of, uh, out of thin air. The Bible tells us that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Greater love has no man than this, that they lay down their lives for, for their friends. The, those who have given their lives are worthy of our honor and respect. But we also, we worship today because we have a God who has done this for us as well, through his own son. So as we celebrate those who have given their all for this country, we realize we also have a Lord who has given his all for us. So let's open our time in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this day, and we thank you for the opportunity to come together uh, to worship you, Lord. As we celebrate this weekend uh, throughout our country, those who have, uh, are currently sacrificing and those who have sacrificed themselves for this country, we know that you have sacrificed yourself for us. You have demonstrated love far before any of us did. While we were still sinners, you died for us. So, Lord, we celebrate you today, and, Lord, we will celebrate you in song. We will celebrate you by looking at your word and applying it to our lives. So, Lord, we thank you uh, that we have an, a wonderful God who shows us what it means to genuinely sacrifice, what it means to be selfless and to put others before ourselves. Lord, we thank you for the great, uh, the great picture of love that you have given us. And I pray that we would spread this picture of love throughout our community and throughout our world, Father. Lord, that we would walk in a way that honors and glorifies you as a body of believers. Lord, we want to give you honor and praise for all that you have done for us. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. I have a number of announcements to share with you. Uh, first and foremost, uh, I want to uh, address uh, so obviously, most of you guys know there have been some significant changes to our uh, state and government's, uh, national government's policy about masks. I, I wanted to address this with you. Um, for this week, uh, we are going to keep our, uh, our social distancing and mask guidelines in place. Um, but starting next week, uh, we are going to make uh, masks during the Sunday service optional. Uh, if you choose to continue to wear a mask, you are more than welcome to do so. Uh, but if you are comfortable uh, not wearing a mask, uh, that, that's, uh, that's going to be optional starting at next week's service. Uh, as a deacon board, we've met and we've talked about this. Uh, our, our plan is next week, uh, masks will be optional. Uh, and then we're going to kind of keep an eye on how things are progressing in our community, in our state, and in, in the country. Uh, if uh, numbers continue to uh, remain what they are and go down the week after that, uh, we are planning to take the tapes off the pews and maybe refinish them. Uh, <laughs> uh, we're going to take the tapes off the pews um, and, uh, and take down our social distancing guidelines. Uh, but we wanted to do this step by step. So it's uh, we could just say hey everything's done but if we get a spike in this area and, uh, and stuff like that and we have to put all that stuff back into place it would be much easier for us to do it uh, step by step so uh, next week we will be mask optional um, the week after that we will be social distancing optional uh, and we will uh, we will be working on um, trying to get back to I guess the old normal, is, is that what it was? <laughs> so uh, working our way back uh, to, uh, to what you were used to. If you don't have a mask with you uh, today, that's okay. That's not the end of the world. There are some if you, if, if you want some in the, uh, in the narthex. If you don't have your mask today, it's, it's not the end of the world. We're not going to kick you out of church. Uh, so, um, uh, but uh, that, that is uh, what the deacons, we've met together. We've prayed about it. Uh, we wanted to do uh, over the next few weeks a, a rollback. Uh, the one thing I would say is I know I, we've been at this for what, about a year and a half now. Um, I know that there are people who are up and down the spectrum about masks and social distancing and all that. And 
Every person has their own convictions about what is the right thing to do. Um, and uh, one of the things as we do this, uh, and one of the things uh, I think we've been very blessed with in this church, and I know this has not been in every church, is there has been a, uh, while I'm sure that everybody in this congregation does not believe exactly the same in every area, uh, there has been great unity uh, and, and great kindness towards people who even believe differently. And I believe that's biblical. So as we go through this, I wanted to remind you uh, of what the Bible says about each person's convictions. Paul writes this in Romans chapter 14, uh, verses 2 to 4. He says this, One person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another eats only vegetables. The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not. And the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does, for God has accepted them. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master, servants stand or fall, and they will stand, for the Lord is able to make them stand. I, I, I say all this because, one, I say this as commendable to you as a congregation. This has been... Uh, these, this last year has divided many places and many things, but as a church, we have been united, even though we, frankly, we may have our own personal convictions about each of those things. And I would encourage you, as we're rolling back some of those things, maybe we're doing it too fast in some of your minds, maybe we're doing it too slow in some of your minds. Uh, ultimately, there, there has been no guidebook that's come down from heaven on how to do these things. Um, so we thank you. Um, and we ask you to respect other people's convictions. Um, people are doing what they believe is right because hopefully they've prayed about it and God has directed in their hearts uh, what they would do. So I ask you guys as we go through this process of pulling some of these things back that we do it with a godly idea uh, and a godly respect for other people's convictions. Well, that's, uh, that's where we're going to go. If you have any questions, you're welcome to talk to me about it. Uh, any of the deacons uh, will be glad to uh, uh, go over exactly what that will look like uh, in, the, in the coming weeks. Um, the good news is I feel like there's light at the end of the tunnel, <laughs> and that's, uh, that's something uh, to be very excited about. A couple other announcements I wanted to share with you guys. Um, our, our youth night uh, schedule has ended uh, for, uh, uh, throughout the rest of the summer. We had our last youth night uh, last Sunday night. That being said, uh, we're not done with our youth, uh, our youth group activities through the summer. We do have some uh, activities uh, and obviously a missions uh, trip that is planned. Uh, we're going to be doing uh, the second of our two community cleanups. We're actually planning to do two locations next Sunday, uh, and our, our hope is that we'll raise $500 for each of those locations that we're cleaning. So we're hoping next Sunday to raise $1,000 uh, for our mission trips, which would be the equivalent of paying for basically five of our young people to go on the mission trip. Uh, so that's going to be next Sunday. Uh, we're going to be meeting here at, we're going to be here at the church, uh, have lunch at the church, and then we're going to go out uh, to a couple different locations uh, where uh, we're going to be doing some cleaning. Uh, the Iron Men, that's our, that's our men's group, uh, which has been meeting on Monday night. Last Monday night, they met at Lighthouse with uh, a couple other men's group. We had our, our community uh, men's fellowship, which continues to be uh, just an incredible blessing, uh, an incredible encouragement to uh, men's groups throughout the community. Uh, we, were not, we will not be meeting uh, this Monday because it is Memorial Day, but we will be back uh, the following Monday uh, starting at 6 o'clock here at the church. We will be having prayer meeting uh, this Wednesday night uh, starting at 7 o'clock. We'll be meeting here. Uh, usually we meet out in the narthex. Um, so uh, if you'd like to join us uh, for that, we would uh, love to have you there as we uh, pray together. Uh, a, couple, a couple other updates. Um, I, I did want to let you know uh, that the, uh, the money that we needed uh, to repair the, uh, the air conditioners in the Narthex uh, has all come in. Um, we, uh, that has been fully funded, so um, we're, we're there. Um, so uh, first of all, thank you so much uh, for, for your generosity. Uh, the air conditioners were installed on, what was it, Wednesday morning? I think it was Wednesday morning. Uh, so we have, we have air conditioning in the Narthex again. Uh, so uh, thank you guys uh, for, for all your giving. Um, and uh, that, that need has been taken care of. Uh, next Sunday is Communion Sunday. Uh, we're going to be uh, we're going to be worshiping the Lord together as we uh, remember His death and resurrection for us. 
uh, as we do that as a community of believers together. So uh, just wanted to make you aware of that. Also next Sunday, um, we are going to have a uh, a time to say farewell to Susan Johnson. She is uh, uh, moving to Mississippi uh, in the next week or so. Uh, next week, uh, following the service, we're going to have uh, a, a little bit of time, uh, a gathering together uh, to uh, celebrate uh, Susan's time here at the church uh, and, and the wonderful blessing that she has been to this community of believers before she leaves. Uh, so that'll take place uh, right after the service. We'll have uh, a couple snacks out in the Narthex and uh, just some time if you haven't got a chance to wish Susan well and thank her for her time for you to be able to do that. Well, that's all the announcements I have, which seems like it was a lot of announcements. I'm going to ask Faye to come up uh, this time, and she's going to lead us in some praise and worship. As you can see from your program, we're going to sing two very patriotic songs this morning um, in honor of those who have served our country and in light of all that God has blessed us with as citizens of this country and the freedoms that we still enjoy to this day. May we all be thankful for that special gift that he's given to each one of us. And may we be honoring those who have given so much of themselves. Please stand as we sing these two hymns together. We're going to sing three verses of each one. <clears throat> America the Beautiful truly reminds us of all the beauty we see in this country from the East Coast to the West Coast and all the beautiful land he has created for us to enjoy and to be responsible for America the Beautiful.
guys know I had a beard? Maybe, yeah. <laughs> I trimmed it up since it's getting, it's getting warmer outside. Well, as you guys know, it is uh, Memorial Day weekend, and many Americans will take time over the course of this weekend uh, to reflect on the many who have given their lives in service of this country. Uh, while these men and women are certainly uh, worthy of our honor and respect, what we see in the book of Acts is that they are not the only ones throughout history who have offered their lives for a great kingdom. As we return to the book of Acts, and we're going to be in Acts chapter 5, uh, looking at, uh, we're going to be looking at verses uh, 17 to 42 today, uh, we see that many of the followers of Jesus Christ would go and offer up everything, including their own lives, to make sure that the good news continued to be preached throughout the world. Fox's Book of Martyrs is uh, one of the more uh, famous and, and compelling books in church history. Uh, and it records many of the stories of men and women and even children throughout church history who have given their lives, given everything, for the witness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Here's what's written about the author of the book of Acts, the book that we're studying, Luke. As an educated man, Fox's Book of Martyrs writes, Luke was a good companion for Paul on all of his journeys. While so many study and read and try and discover the truth of the matter, Luke chose instead to go to the source and to find out for himself. Having learned of Paul's, Paul during the ministry, his ministry in Antioch, Luke went to hear the man speak on this new religion called Christianity. When it came time to take the message of that faith on the road, Luke volunteered to go along and record all of it for posterity. Thus, Luke became the first Christian historian and contributed more to the New Testament than anyone who was not an apostle. While other men passed in and out of Paul's ministry, Luke stuck close to the end. Not long before his execution in Rome, Paul wrote 2 Timothy, Do your best to come to me quickly, for Demas, because he has loved this world, has deserted me, and has gone to Thessalon Thessalonica. Thessalonica? Wow, I can't say that today. <laughs> Cretan has gone to Galatia. I can't say that. And Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Despite persecution and temptation, Luke has stayed faithful to the end. After Paul's execution, Luke left Rome. He was so committed to the missionary life that he continued to travel and teach for the rest of his life. His ministry after the death of Paul lasted almost 30 years. Everywhere he traveled is not well recorded. The book of Acts ends at Paul's second imprisonment. And no writings of Luke exist beyond that. It is known, though, that he ended his days in Greece, where he preached the gospel and opposed the worship of Greek gods among the people of the Peloponnesian cities, probably proclaiming that he had, as he had earlier recorded in the book of Acts, there is salvation in no one else but Jesus. There is no other name in all of heaven for people call to be saved. Luke so upset the world of the idolatrous priests with his teaching that they incited a mob against him and took him to an olive grove near the port city of Patras, where he was hanged to death in a green olive tree. Luke was 84 years old when he gave his life for Christ. Well, as we've seen through our study of the book of Acts, for the most part, everything in the first couple chapters of Acts has been amazing. They, the apostles and the followers of Jesus Christ received the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. They preached the good news of Jesus and thousands come to the Lord. They continue to preach. The church continues to grow. Needs are met. The gospel is preached. The number of followers of Jesus Christ in the city of Jerusalem is now beyond what Luke is able to number in the book of Acts. For the most part, everything has gone great through the first few chapters of the book of Acts. But in chapter 5, we see that things begin to change. First, we see the sin of Ananias and Sapphira and God's discipline of both Ananias and Sapphira and the church. The church receives the Lord's discipline 
and continues to grow. But as we see, discipline has a point and has a purpose. Because things were not about to get easier for the church. What we see in the book of Acts is things were about to get significantly more difficult. As the church is about to face the first of what would be centuries worth of persecution. And that's where we're at today in Acts chapter 5. We're going to be looking at verses 17 to 42 today. This is a pretty long section, uh, but there's a lot that's covered here that we want to look at today. So if you have your Bibles, we're in Acts chapter 5, starting with verse 17. Here's what God's Word has to say. Then the high priests and all the associates who were members of the party of the Sadducees were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go, stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people all about this new life. At daybreak, they entered the temple courts, as they had been told, and began to teach the people. When the high priest and the associates arrived, they called together the Sanhedrin, the full assembly of the elders of Israel, and sent to the jail for the apostles. But on arriving at the jails, uh, at the jail, the officers did not find them there. So they went back and reported, We found the jail securely locked, with the guards standing at the door. But when we opened them, there was no one inside. On hearing this report, the captain of the temple guards and the chief priests were at a loss, wondering what, what this might lead to. Then someone came and said, Look, the men you put in jail are standing in the temple courts teaching the people. At that, the captain went with his officers and brought the apostles. They did not use force because they feared that the people would stone them. The apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said. You have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the apostles replied, we must obey God rather than human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. God exalted him to the right hand as prince and savior, that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, they were furious, and they wanted to put them to death. But a Pharisee by the name of Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, who was honored by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered that the men be put outside for a little while. Then he addressed the Sanhedrin. Men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do with these men. Some time ago, Thaddeus appeared, claiming to be someone, and about 400 men rallied to him. He was killed, and all his followers were dispersed, and it came to nothing. After him, Judas... The Galilean appeared in the days of the census that, and led a band of people in revolt. He too was killed, and all his followers scattered. Therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go, for if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourself fighting against God. His speech persuaded them. They called, the, they called the apostles in and had them flogged. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing that they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Day after day, in the temple courts, from house to house, never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. Let's pray and we'll look at these verses together. Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, we thank you uh, that we can consider your word and we can look at these men and women who gave everything, who sacrificed everything for the sake of the good news of Jesus. The news that we, so many years later and <laughs> thousands and thousands of miles away, have had the privilege of accepting ourselves because of the sacrifice of those who came before us. Lord, as we look at the persecution that they went through and realize that there is still persecution happening in our world today, guide us and direct us as we see how they handled the difficulties 
that were put before them through your Holy Spirit. Guide and direct us as we study these things today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this is a pretty huge passage that we tackled today, but I wanted to look at this uh, because I, I, I think there's a lot of things that are going on here that are very important to us. And one of the most interesting differences between the gospel and the book of Acts is that when Jesus had issues with the religious leaders, do you remember what group of religious leaders Jesus often struggled with? Who was it? It was the Pharisees, yeah. Over and over again throughout the Gospels, we spent a long time looking at the book of Matthew. It was almost always it was the Pharisees that Jesus had interest, had his run-ins with. But here when we get to the book of Acts, while we hear about the Pharisees, who is it that the apostles, the church, is battling with? It's really not the Pharisees, it's the it's the Sadducees, and, and that's what we see here. Uh, and the reason for that is this. In the Gospels, Jesus was consistently challenging what it meant to have a right relationship with God. When he was preaching to Israel, Israel thought that they were saved by the things that they did. Why did they believe that? Because that's what the Pharisees had taught them. They gave them rule after rule, and the righteousness didn't, didn't come from grace. It came from their ability to follow the traditions of the Pharisees. For the Pharisees, they had spent years dedicating themselves to finding out exactly what God wanted. But unfortunately for them, God himself, through Jesus Christ, was pointing out to them the error of their ways. But here in the book of Acts, Luke has pointed out in several different places that the church has a right relationship with God. Over and over again, we see them doing the things that God has called them to do. We've gone back to the gospel and we see over and over again, the church is doing the very things that Jesus said that they should be called to do. In other words, for the most part, the church had a right relationship with God. And they were changing the world around them. They were literally changing the city of Jerusalem because of their right relationship with God. And that's, and that's what really bothered the Sadducees. Because the truth is, the Sadducees didn't care as much about the religion of the Jews as they did about its culture. The church, which had grown to an uncountable number, was meeting openly in the temple. And now it was a threat that went way beyond religion. It went to the very heart of the Sadducees' livelihood and position. See, for the Pharisees, for whatever mistakes they made, they actually genuinely cared about God. For the Sadducees, this was about their culture. This was about their place in Jewish society. And now the church meeting at the temple that the Sadducees controlled this was about changing their way of life. See, the Sadducees ran the temple. They oversaw the Sanhedrin. In general, the Sadducees didn't believe in the supernatural. They didn't believe in life after death, including the resurrection. So the church had gone from being a nuisance that needed to be stuffed out to destroying the things that the Sadducees did believe in. They didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in eternal life. What did they believe in? They believed in life here and now. And you know what the church was doing? Disrupting their here and now. So why are the Sadducees the villain of the book of Acts and not the Pharisees? Well, we'll, we'll see that as we continue through this passage. So today we're going to look at the persecution of the church and how they responded to it. Uh, Acts chapter 5 really marks the beginning of the public persecution of the church. Uh, and church history has shown that this is not, this doesn't end with Acts chapter 5. We'll see as we go throughout the book of Acts, there are multiple times of intense persecution for the church. This is going to be the first of them, but it is certainly not the last. Church history is marked in nearly every place that the gospel has gone with intense persecution. Throughout history, we have seen millions of people give up their livelihoods, their freedoms, and even their lives for the sake of the good news of Jesus Christ. And in these places, there's been a compelling equation that takes place, and we see it in these passages. We see persecution, 
And we see when people are persecuted, those who are persistent in their relationship with Christ, it leads to a powerful witness. So that's what we're going to look at today. The persecution of the church, the persistence of the church, and how it leads to a powerful witness. Well, let's start by looking at the persecution. And this was a huge passage that we looked at. They are persecuted in a number of different ways, verses 17 and 18, 27 and 28, and and verse 40. Uh, And what's interesting is it's not just Peter and John. If you remember a a couple chapters back, remember Peter and John heal that blind beggar at the beautiful gate, and and they're brought in before the Sanhedrin, and they're asked a bunch of kind of rhetorical questions uh, that were really meant to kind of scare them. Well, it's not just Peter and John that are brought before the Sanhedrin this time. It is all of the apostles, all of Jesus' disciples, all these people who have seen Jesus Christ firsthand, they are brought in before the Sanhedrin. And they're persecuted in a number of different ways uh, through this verse. Number one, they're arrested. They're all taken and thrown into jail. After that, they're required to appear before the Sanhedrin. They don't get a choice in the matter. They are rearrested and then brought before the Sanhedrin. And, the, and we're also, we also find out in verse 40 that they're flogged. That, that term flogging is to be whipped. Uh, these are literally the exact same things that happened to Jesus, right? Uh, Jesus was arrested in the garden. He was forced to meet before the Sanhedrin in the middle of the night, and then he was flogged just like the disciples are. See, one of the things that the Bible makes abundantly clear is that persecution is not the result of failure to follow Jesus Christ. It is the proof that we're doing it right. Here, let me show you what I mean. Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 to 12. Blessed are those who who are persecuted because of righteousness. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Jesus makes it very clear from his very first sermon that those who are following Jesus Christ are going to face persecution. It's not the mark that we're doing it wrong. You say, oh man, I, I, like people are coming against me. May, I, I must not be doing a good job. No, Jesus says, listen, if people are coming against you, you are doing it right. From the very beginning of his ministry, this was one of the very first things that Jesus preached. And listen, this isn't just a New Testament thing. Jesus says, listen, this is what they did to the prophets that God sent in the Old Testament. Jeremiah was thrown in a cistern. Ezekiel was persecuted. All these prophets uh, that Daniel, (laughs) the guy was thrown in a lion's den. This is what happens when we give testimony to the goodness and grace of God. Jesus wasn't the only person who said this in the Bible. Paul writes this in 2 Timothy 3.12. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, will be persecuted. In other words, if you're dealing with persecution in your life, the Bible says you don't have to feel weird about it. This is what happens to people who are giving genuine witness of Jesus Christ. Paul was no stranger to persecution, and he he warned that it's an expected part of being a follower of Jesus Christ. Peter writes this in one of his letters, 1 Peter 4.14, If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Amazingly, the apostles saw persecution as what? As a blessing, as an honor, not as a deterrent. Look at verse 41 with me again. Look at what it says here. It says, the apostles left the Sanhedrin. This is after they had been arrested twice, after they had been forced to stand before the Sanhedrin, and after they had been flogged, it says, the apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for his name. Did the apostles see persecution as failure? No, they saw it as success. 
They said, man, we must be doing it right because everywhere we read, Jesus said, hey, if you're doing this right, you're going to be persecuted. Paul says, if you're doing this right, you're going to be persecuted. They said, yeah, we must be doing something right because people are persecuting us. Which led to the second part of the equation. Those who follow Jesus Christ will be persecuted. So what do we do when we face persecution? We persist. And that's exactly what the apostles did in these verses. The second part of this equation is that no matter how often or how cruelly the followers of Jesus Christ were persecuted, they just kept on coming, didn't they? We, we see in these passages they are thrown in jail. What happens? Yeah, an angel lets them out and he says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go right back to teaching. <laughs> this, is, this is pretty comical, actually, when you look at it in the Bible. The angel lets them out and what do they do? They go right back to where they were. So the Sanhedrin's missing. The Sanhedrin is meeting together. They can't find the apostles. And the apostles don't even leave the temple, do they? They go right back. They're, they're within, the, the Sanhedrin could see where they're at from where they're meeting. These guys are so brazen, and I guess if an angel let me out of jail, I would be like, well, I guess I must be doing what God wants me to do. So they go, literally, they don't even leave the temple, and they go right back to preaching. The Sanhedrin bring them in. They say, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to put the blood of Jesus Christ on our hands? I mean, I think we already know. We, we studied the book of Matthew. The blood of Jesus was on their hands. They're like, listen, you're trying to condemn us of this man's death. And what, was, what were the apostles' response? It is better to obey God than to obey men. They just kept on coming. They kept on persisting. And even when they get whipped, the Sanhedrin, when they whipped these guys, did they expect them to be leaving, jumping around, and praising God? No. <laughs> and the apostles leave, and they're cheering as they leave. They're like, wow, that didn't go the way we expected. No matter what they did, the apostles kept on moving. The early church is like watching a Rocky movie. How many of you have ever watched a Rocky movie? They're pretty much all the same, right? Rocky gets beat up. He's, he's facing someone who's bigger and faster than he is. And they spend, you know, the first, they, they spend the entire match him getting pummeled and beat up and knocked down. And what does Rocky do? He gets back up. <laughs> Sorry, that was a really bad impression. Come on, hit me again. And, and, that's, what, and that's, what the, that's what the apostles do here. They're like Rocky. They're just getting pummeled, hit over and over again, knocked down, knocked down. What do they do? They just get back up. Why? Because they understood exactly what they were fighting for. In 1 Peter 2.20, we read this. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and endure it, this is commendable before God. This is Peter writing this. Does Peter know what he's talking about here? My guess is that as a young man, do you think Peter took beatings for doing what was wrong? Oh, yeah. I, I think as we look at the, when we look at Peter, Peter says a lot of things that he probably shouldn't. Peter's incredibly impetuous. I bet you as a young man, he had his fair share of discipline, right? He says, listen... As a kid, I got, I got whooped for doing the wrong thing, right? <laughs> He's like, what good is that? He says, now as an adult, as a follower of Jesus Christ, I may still be getting beatings, but it's for enduring what is good, and that is commendable for God. See, the church never lost sight of who they were doing this for. Why? Because they weren't fighting for their, way, for their way of life, like the Sadducees were. They weren't fighting for their personal rights. They weren't fighting for their political ideology. They weren't even fighting for their own theology. They were able to persist through persecution because they were doing it all for the name and the calling of Jesus Christ. Why could they keep getting back up? because they knew exactly why they were getting back up. Persistence paid off for an American astronomer by the name of Clyde Tombaugh, 
who discovered the planet Pluto. Now, I know what you may be saying. Some of you would be like, wait a second, Pastor George. Pluto is not a planet anymore. I reject that. I grew up learning that Pluto is a planet. That's messed up. How can you just take planet ship away? My goodness, that's so harsh. Anyway, after astronomers calculated a probable orbit for the suspected heavenly body, Tom Ball took up the search in March of 1929. Time magazine recorded the investigation. He examined scores of telescopic photographs, each showing tens of thousands of star images in pairs under the dual microscope. It often took three days to scan a single pair. It was exhausting, eye-cracking work. In his own words, brutal and tedious. And it went on for months. Star by star, he examined over 20 million images. Then on February 18, 1930, as he was blinking at a pair of photographs in the constellation Gemini, I suddenly came on the image of Pluto. It was the most dramatic discovery in the, in the heavenly bodies in nearly 100 years. See, throughout history, people have gone, through gone to incredible lengths for things that are, as much as I love Pluto, far less important than the life-changing message of, good, of the good news of Jesus Christ. God has given us an incredible ability to persist, to continue when we know that there is something worth continuing for. The apostles faced persecution. Why? Because they were doing what God had called them to do. And when they faced persecution, they didn't run away. They persisted. Why? Because they knew that what they were doing matters. The same is true for us today. Persecution still exists in our world today. And we still need to persist. Because the good news of Jesus Christ is just as important, just as powerful, just as eternity changing now as it was back then. Well, we see this equation. Persistence plus perseverance equals what? A powerful witness. And that's what we see here in these verses. The end result of people who persevere through persecution is that they have a powerful witness to others. It may not be immediately obvious in this passage, but the apostles' witness here before the Sanhedrin has a, had a profound and lasting impact on Jewish culture. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, the Pharisees were the primary adversary of Jesus in the Gospels. However, that actually begins to change as a result of the apostles' witness here during their persecution. In verses 33 to 39, we're told that a Pharisee by the name of Gamaliel stands up as the Sanhedrin had become so angry that they were about to put the apostles to death. The Sanhedrin had heard enough. They had already broken the law to kill Jesus, and they were kind of at the point where they had just had enough of the apostles apostles and the apostles get up and they're like we're not going to listen to you we obey God not you and for for the Sanhedrin and and uh, and the uh, the Sadducees they knew that if they don't stop this now everything was about to change so they had decided we're going to put these men to death we might face repercussions for this but we already know what's going to happen if we don't do anything we can see it so they had decided you know what after this, we're putting these apostles to death. And then this Pharisee by the name of Gamaliel stands up. And he advised them to be careful at what they do. Because there have been many, many people in Jewish history who had claimed to be Messiah and people had followed them. And when that supposed Messiah died, those people died away. But there was something different about Jesus, right? Because Jesus had already died. And yet... His followers didn't fade away. In fact, they were growing by the day. And Gamaliel recognized this. And he said, listen, you may find yourself fighting against God here. Needless to say, the admission by a Pharisee that the followers of Jesus may be from God was a huge admission, wasn't it? 
Remember, all through the Gospels, the Pharisees said, this guy is not from God. So the fact that Gamaliel here, a Pharisee, says, listen, what they're doing might just be from God is a huge change from the party of the Pharisees, isn't it? Up till now, they've been like, this guy's not from God. This guy's got a demon. This guy's Beelzebub, all kinds of stuff. So the fact that any Pharisee would say that what they're doing is from God is an incredible change. And Gamaliel wasn't just any Pharisee. As Luke points out, he was honored among the Jews because of his wisdom. He was the grandson of a famous Pharisee by the name of Hillel. Hillel was uh, quoted many times in rabbinic writings and is famous in Jewish history. And uh, Gamaliel, believe it or not, was the teacher of a young Pharisee by the name of Saul, who we would better know later on as the Apostle Paul. And while this didn't happen overnight, the persecution and the persistence of the apostles started to turn an enemy of Christ into an ally. In fact, by Acts chapter 15, we read this. When they, Paul and Barnabas, came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and by the apostles and elders to whom they reported everything God had done through them. Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. Well, while their theology isn't quite up to snuff here in chapter 15, and that was still a big issue in the church, and we'll get to that. What was interesting is how Luke describes the Pharisees here. They were believers that were now part of the church. These once upon a time enemies of the gospel who constantly stalked Jesus and openly tried to destroy his ministry are now fighting alongside the followers of Jesus Christ. Why? Because they, st they saw how the apostles persevered through persecution. And as a result, they had a powerful witness to those who were once enemies of the cross. I'll close with this story I saw this week. A young man enlisted in the army and was sent to his regiment. The first night he was in his barracks with about 15 other young men who passed their time playing cards and gambling. Before he retired, he fell on his knees and prayed. And they began to curse him and make fun of him. And they threw their boots at him. So it went on night after night. And finally, the young man went and told the chaplain what had taken place. And he asked him, what should he do? Well, said the chaplain, you're not at home now. And you have other men who have just as much right to the barracks as you have. It makes them mad to hear you pray. And the Lord will hear you just as well if you say your prayers in bed and don't provoke them. For weeks after the chaplain, did not see, he didn't see the young man again. But then one day, he saw him and asked, By the way, did you take my advice? I did, for two or three nights. Well, how did it work? Well, said the young man, I felt like a whipped hound. And the third night, I got out of bed, and I knelt down and prayed. Well, asked the chaplain, how did it work? The young soldier answered, we have a prayer meeting in our tent every night. And three of the men who used to throw boots at me are now followers of Jesus Christ. And we're praying for the rest. We might not face persecution the exact same way the disciples did in the book of Acts. We're not, we're not going to be called before the Sanhedrin. It's unlikely here in America that we're going to be whipped for our faith. There are many things that are different. But that doesn't mean that we don't face persecution. That doesn't mean that each and every day we're not tempted to water down what we believe and be quiet about the truth of Jesus Christ. See, persecution still happens. And the equation for persecution is still true today. Persecution plus persistence leads to powerful witness. We can be quiet. We can go to our quarter. We can say our prayers in our bed. But ultimately, 
The same command that was given to the apostles is given to us as well. We are called to go be witnesses, to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ wherever God has put us. That won't always go over well. We may face repercussions at work or among our friends or in our families. <laughs> Those are perse that's persecution as well. It may look different. It may feel different. But the equation still remains. Those who are persistent through persecution are able to have a powerful witness in the kingdom of Christ. The early church is going to demonstrate this over and over and over again. And many people, men, women, and children throughout church history have demonstrated this equation over and over again. And as followers of Jesus Christ, we have the opportunity to do the same. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much uh, for this day. And we know that while there is incredible blessing that comes from being your child, there's also difficulty. And that def difficulty doesn't mean that we're doing it wrong. Oftentimes it means we're doing it right. So Lord, when those difficulties come, and the Bible says that they will come to those who are truly sharing and witnessing to the good news of Jesus Christ, that we would not shrink or wither, but that we would persevere. Because through that perseverance comes incredible witness. We thank you for the many who have come before us and demonstrated that witness to us. And when the opportunity comes for us, pray that we would not shrink from it, but that we would boldly proclaim the good news of your Son, Jesus Christ. We ask all these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.
benediction comes from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 23 and 24. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it.